In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. This is the first Sunday after the Holy Resurrection, after which the church celebrates the Holy 50 days. As we know, Christ stayed with the apostles and the disciples for 40 days, then ascended to heaven before sending us the Holy Spirit in the Pentecost. So this period of the 50 days is one of joy, one of uh, power, one of reassurance that we experience and live with the apostles, the same feeling that they felt. All of our hymns in our church are uh, festive. There's no fasting, no matanyas. So we, we kind of celebrate those, uh, that same feeling that the apostles felt. Because just like St. Luke says in his, in his gospel, to whom he also presented himself alive, suffering uh, after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during the 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. We can say that he spoke great mysteries to the apostles during this time. Um, it's an amazing time. And there uh, were probably many things that the Lord must have accomplished in that time with the apostles after the resurrection, which we see portions of in today's reading. So we'll go through a few of them that we know either through scriptures that give hints to them or also to through tradition. Uh, the first one is that Christ during this time, this joyous time, he opened to them the meaning of scripture and what is meant um, with all the things that uh, he, uh, you know, that he talked to them about. Uh, for example, on Luke uh, chapter 24, he explained to them what was said in all of the scriptures concerning himself when he met with the apostles on the road to Emmaus. Uh, likewise in Luke 24, then he opened their minds so that they could understand the scriptures. We have to ask, um, Christ, who is the author of all wisdom. He's the source of all of our understanding of scripture. He's the one who wrote it. He is wisdom itself uh, to reveal to us the meaning of scripture. So when we approach scripture, we don't approach it like other books where we try to understand it with our own mental capacity. In understanding scripture, we have to ask the author himself, which is, of course, God. And he's there present with us in our studies and in our uh, uh, diving deep into the scriptures. So we're blessed also to have the writings of many church fathers that are very easily accessible uh, now in our time more than any other time in church history. We have them easily accessible and are um, a great resource for us to understand the meanings of scripture. Um, scripture everywhere encourages us to have a deeper understanding uh, of what the Bible says. In Isaiah chapter 33, uh, it says, wisdom and knowledge will be the stability of your times and the strength of salvation. And in Hosea, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And many other similar verses that encourage us to understand scripture and to dive deeper in our, our, in our beliefs and our faith. Um, because our faith and, of, of course, our spirituality are tied together. As you grow in understanding, your spirituality grows. And as you grow in spirituality, your understanding grows. Each reciprocally increases the other. So it's really beneficial for us and even essential for us to dive deeper into the scriptures. And that's what he did during the 40 days. The second thing he, we can say he did is he brought to their remembrance the things that he did during the three-year ministry. Um, especially during these times, we barely know what day it is during this quarantine that we're all going through, let alone what happened in the last three years. And some events were really critical towards our salvation and, and our beliefs. So Christ brought their remembrance uh, to the things that he did during the three-year ministry. As it says in Luke chapter 24, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you. And all things that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law, of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. We could say that generally forgetfulness in the spiritual life can be very dangerous to our spiritual life. When we consider, for example, the Israelites who uh, saw the mighty hand of God and all the wonders that he did in releasing them from slavery, uh, the, the plagues and, and how he bent Pharaoh's uh, to his will, even though Pharaoh wasn't willing to, and how they walk through pillars of water uh, and the pillars of smoke and of fire, and they walk through walls of water, coming clean on the other side, freed from the, the bondage of their enemy. But it's interesting, only a few days later, you find them melting their gold 
and shaping it into a cow and worshiping it. Very strange, right? When we think about it, we, we think it's, um, it's, it's a very strange thing to do, to go from seeing all these wonders to worshiping a, a man-made a golden calf. But we fall into that same trap sometimes when we don't remind ourselves of the scriptures. We have to keep these wonders and the things that God accomplished fresh in our minds always. Um, uh, we and, you know, as uh, members of our church, you know, we've witnessed greater things than what Moses and the Israelites saw coming out of Egypt. So the church aims to always remind us of the mighty acts that God has accomplished in, in our history, in, in the history that our inheritance as Christians, uh, from the icons to the readings, to the hymns, the meetings, the liturgies, the, the feast and the calendar of the church, all are aimed at you know, causing us to remember these amazing things that God has done and the actions of our Lord that he accomplished in his ministry, but also the works that he's done in the lives of the saints throughout the 2000 year history of our church. So we must keep scriptures first and foremost, uh, you know, open in our households and in our families and in our own uh, spiritual life that we have to keep uh, the scriptures open and we read them frequently. As Pope Shenouda once said, you know, keep the Bible and the Bible will keep you. The third thing he did was he taught them some of some of the elements of church tradition, like the sacraments or like the liturgy. Um, though all of the apostles saw the Lord and dealt firsthand with Christ during these 40 days, and not just the apostles, but many more as well, saw him in the flesh and ate with him and dealt with him and handled him. But most of the apostles did not write scripture or did not write any epistles or gospels. When we look at, for example, who actually uh, wrote and made up the New Testament, we look at St. Jude, who only wrote a one chapter epistle, St. James, who only wrote one epistle, St. Peter only wrote two epistles. You know, the St. Saint, uh, Peter, of all people, only wrote two epistles. St. Matthew wrote one gospel and St. John wrote one gospel, three epistles and revelations. So you have basically Jude, James, Peter, Matthew, and John. So only five of the 12 wrote uh, something to contribute towards the New Testament. And when we have uh, St. Mark, who is, of course, one of the 70 apostles, was an eyewitness uh, of many of the things that Christ did um, and was also a nephew of St. Peter, he also wrote one gospel. St. Paul, in his epistles, uh, he wrote you know many epistles in the New Testament and but he wrote them after the 40 days that we're talking about today and the rest of the new testament was written by saint luke who was a disciple of saint paul some people say that he could have been also one of the 70 apostles um, but he definitely interviewed other disciples the apostles and saint mary herself to get some of the information contained in his gospel so we only have these handful of uh eyewitnesses that contributed to the new testament of course, we can say that the rest of the 68 or 69, 70 apostles and the other six of the 12 disciples who preached in the whole world taught things that they received from Christ. Of course they did. And even the five disciples and St. Mark and St. Luke and um, who were there during the 40 days, possibly St. Luke, um, we know that they what they contributed to the New Testament didn't just teach what they wrote. They also taught things verbally. And the scripture itself alludes to this, as St. John, one of the 12 says, having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face. So what were these things that he spoke face to face, but not write in his epistles or in his gospels or in Revelation? Even St. Paul himself says this, he says, and the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And he says, and the things that you have heard, not the things that you have read, but the things that you have heard from me, commit these to faithful men who will teach others. So how did the Lord teach them to teach us? How did, the, how did, they, how did their teachings reach us if it wasn't through New Testament? Of course, the answer is church tradition. And we know that some of these things in the 40 days that Christ himself taught, during this uh, 40 days, uh, included the Eucharist. Some things are written and other things are hinted about in scripture. Um, but most importantly, the Eucharist and the baptism, we know that Christ during these 40 days um, uh, kind of reestablished the liturgies 
and and reminded them of the uh, the Last Supper and and the institution of the Eucharist, and um, and so he established these things. And we see all the twelve disciples and the seventy apostles. They learn these things from him during this precious few days of forty days with Christ, and then they go out into the whole world preaching and conducting liturgies. That's what they did for the New Testament wasn't written yet. And it says here, for I received in St. Paul in, in 1 Corinthians, for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus Christ came on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and he instituted the Eucharist. It's very amazing to see sometimes when you um, go to other traditional churches like the Catholic Church um, or the other Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox churches, or even some very traditional um, uh, like Lutheran churches. You know, uh, as you know, uh, as you may know, that our churches have been separated for, um, you know, 1500 years since the year 451. But these churches, these traditional churches, even the Lutheran churches, which of course started the Protestant movement, even they have some basic framework of the liturgy. So what does that tell us that after 15th century of not speaking uh, up until only recently, that you have very, the very similar framework for the liturgy and, um, and the masses that the Catholics and the Eastern Orthodox that they all practice, what does it show that if we haven't talked for so long and yet we have the same basic uh, framework, you know, the anaphora, the greet one another with a holy kiss, holy God, holy mighty, holy immortal, those are all in all the uh, liturgies. So what does that tell you, except that, of course, that we have a common beginning when it comes to the liturgy, which, of course, that common beginning is Christ himself. The liturgies were therefore written before um, the New Testament was put together, and let alone distributed to the whole world, by the apostles themselves as they learned it from Christ especially during this uh, holy time of 40 days. So from the resurrection of Christ to the last writing of the New Testament, we have about 67 years ago. So the Christians during this time, they had the liturgy. During this time, they practiced the liturgy. So the liturgy, when it speaks about the anaphora and, and speaks about how Christ instituted the, um, the Eucharist, they're not quoting a Bible that's been translated or one of the gospels. It's a primary source. They're quoting because the apostles themselves wrote the, uh, the, the basic framework of the liturgy. And so they're quoting it directly as they've heard it. It's one of the primary sources. So another thing that Christ did during this time is he gave them the priestly authority so that the Holy Spirit can work through the priest to, um, as an instrument uh, you know, to perform the sacraments. So in today's reading, we read, and when he had said this, he breathed on them. A very strange thing he does, he breathed on them, reminding us of what he did in Genesis uh, when he breathed life uh, into creation. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This receiving of the Holy Spirit, of course, was before the Pentecost and because it was for a different purpose, for the priestly office, for the performance of the sacraments that um, were, was going to happen later with the apostles and, of course, their successors as well. So this breath uh, from Christ was given to St. Mark, one of the 70, and then later on as he converted Ananias, right, the second uh, bishop of Alexandria, and through the 2000 year, through the ages, right, to Pope Shenouda, to Amba Serapion, our metropolitan of our diocese, to the priests of our diocese, to administer the, the, uh, the uh, sacraments such as the Eucharist, the baptisms, and the confessions, and the anointing of the, of the Holy Spirit through the Myroon. And so um, we receive that, right? It's a, it's a really amazing gift that we have that the breath of Christ uh, that causes the forgiveness of our sins, that looses us from sins, that recreates our human nature and renews us to be children of God is active through the ages, through the administration of the uh, sacraments that we receive um, if we live holy lives and if we have faith, of course, in our Lord Jesus Christ. You'll notice uh, the priest will blow if you ever have witnessed um, during a confession or if you've witnessed during the, if a bishop anoints uh, a new priest, uh, you'll see that the bishop will blow on the, uh, 
the priest to give him that priestly authority. So the same breath of Christ to the apostles and through the ages to the priest and the priest will blow on you when you confess and you confess your sins. The priest is just an instrument. It's just a tool. It's that breath of Christ, that Christ himself present and forgiving us our sins. That's that breath that has traveled 2000 years to the present age to affect us uh, is an amazing gift that we have. And we thank God. The fifth thing that he did during this time was he gave the great command or what's called the great commission. Uh, he says in today's reading, as the father has sent me, I also send you. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, as it says in Matthew, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. And in Mark, it says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. So he's given, a, he's given in the past, I'm not sure how to help with that. he's given similar requests in, um, in the Old Testament to some of the prophets. For example, he gave to Moses um, that same request to preach to Pharaoh. And as you know, Moses says to the Lord, oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither before nor since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. And similarly to Jeremiah, he says, whom he knew, of course, before he was born, only, only a handful of, you know, besides John the Baptist, uh, Jeremiah, he says of Jeremiah that he knew him before he was born. And um, it says, and Jeremiah responds to the request to go preach, Ah, Lord, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. And God rebukes him, saying, do not say that I am a youth. Don't use that as an excuse because I'm with you. So both with Moses and with Jeremiah as examples, they were preaching on a lower scale, but they had some hesitancy, right? They, they were a little bit of afraid or nervous or felt that their weakness to go preach. But when you look at the apostles, in contrast, they did not hesitate or object Um. And their task was much larger because rather than speaking to a tyrant or to a pharaoh, uh, they preached to the whole world and to the strongest empire that ever existed up until that time uh, on earth. And so they preached to the whole world. They willingly faced death, all of them except for St. John, of course. They all were martyred with courage that is not human. And they did so with uh eagerness and enthusiasm. It was really an interesting, um, a very interesting difference between what the prophet, prophets, when they were asked to preach versus the apostles, even though the apostles task was much greater because it was to the whole world. But why was that the case? It was because they had an assurance that was above that of the prophets. The, the assurance that, that the apostles received was much larger than the assurance that like a burning bush or or any other um, or a voice speaking to them uh, when God spoke to them. The assurance that the apostles received was much deeper. And this is the sixth thing that uh, that God that Christ did uh, during this 40 days. He gives a depth of assurance that would later become unshakable in the lives of the apostles. The story highlights how the disciples today, when we read, were locked in a room in fear of the Jews of the time who were seeking to kill them. Uh, they were in a type of quarantine. They were locked in their homes. They were stuck in their homes and they were afraid. And as the doors were lo locked and shut, the doors were locked, he, Christ himself entered and says, peace be with you. And he showed, him, he showed them his wounds on his hands and on his side. This shows a few things. First, he refers to himself as peace. As Christ himself said, a little while and you will not see me. And again, a little while you will see me because I go to the Father. But I will see you again and your heart will rejoice and your joy no one will take from you. St. Cyril of Alexandria says, Whoever, wherever Christ is present, tranquility of spirit will surely follow. After all, being at peace with one another and with God, should be understood to be the fountain and beginning of every good thing, for he is our peace. He is 
not just the source of peace, but he is peace itself. So when he says, peace be with you, he's giving his presence to us because he is peace. So as the doors were locked and the apostles were in the home behind closed doors, our Lord enters in and says, peace with you. And he showed them, of course, his wounds on his hand and on his side. Also, the fact that he entered into the room while it was locked shows his divinity and his humanity. Just like all the other miracles he performed while he was in the flesh during his ministry, this one also shows that he is both God and human. His wounds show that he was indeed him who walked among them and was crucified. He could have appeared to them in great glory, right? Like, for example, on the mountain of transfiguration where he was shining so bright that we, one can barely look at him, right? He could have showed himself like that. But instead, Christ was intent on appearing as he was before during the three-year ministry and having the apostles handle him, handle his flesh, and be convinced that it was indeed him who arose from the dead. It was the same Christ that he, they're familiar with, uh, that ate the same food with them. And, um, and more importantly, that this flesh that rose from the dead is the same is human flesh. It's the same flesh as our own and that has been resurrected. And once the apostles perceived this, they perceived this amazing truth that Christ was indeed resurrected from the dead. Indeed, in truth, that he was resurrected from the dead. As today's reading continues, it says that they were glad. They rejoiced with gladness. It affected them greatly. For Christ destroyed death and the corruption that once belonged to the human uh, you know, experience, the human flesh, that he is by nature life and God. Now he resurrects from the dead, and we know that this brought gladness to the hearts of the apostles. Not, it's not just because their beloved Lord was risen from the dead. Of course, they probably received a lot of joy from that. But that he did so with our human nature also brought them much gladness because he is the first fruits as the hymn that was beautifully sung today, um, the first fruit of a tree that would yield lots of fruits. It would yield the resurrection of countless uh, humans among humanity. And there will be, and they were very glad because they realized the benefit on a very, very personal level. They knew that they, they themselves would follow this as well. But St. Thomas, as we read today, was not there. And um, so he says that unless he too saw and touched the wounds that he wouldn't believe. But Christ appears again and allows St. Thomas to handle and see the wounds for himself. One could argue that Christ, of course, was going to appear to him anyways, because how else would he receive that priestly authority to go and preach like we know, for example, he went and preached in India. Uh, otherwise, how else would he have received those, um, that priestly authority and go set up liturgies and, and go establish the church there, which still exists to this day? So he may have missed a unique opportunity to believe prior to seeing Christ, because had he had believed before he saw Christ, he would have received the blessing and eventually he would have also seen Christ because Christ would have appeared to him. This opportunity, of course, is with us every day in the church, right, uh, as Christians, uh, to show that faith during trials. Um, likewise, the apostles who were in despair before they, they saw Christ, they could have showed more faith, right? And we, too, when we're going through problems, when we're going through tribulations, when we're going through pandemics even, uh, whatever challenge we have and whatever challenge we're faced with, if we face it with faith and courage, um, eventually we will see Christ. And because it is inevitable, it is inevitable that Christ will appear to us eventually. He will appear. And to take away uh, any of these temporary problems that we're faced with um, that appear like a dark cloud and he blows them away and um, he appears. And of course, we will see him, of course, in our end of days, right? Eventually, we will see Christ. We will see him just like Thomas saw him. Because Christ... When them, he appeared to him, appeared to all of them, and he presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, as St. Luke says, being seen by them during the 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And the New Testament, it seems like the apostles were intent on really emphasizing this. The New Testament saturated with powerful reassurance 
that Christ gives to the apostles. Of all the promises that Christ gives, if you really read scripture, they're full of assurance. And I'll just read a few of them. In John 1, 34, And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God, eyewitness. Again, Luke. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set and order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, that you may know the certainty of the things in which you have been instructed. And in Acts 1.3, to whom he presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, proofs that cannot be denied when really investigated uh, critically. So this Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses in Acts chapter 2. And in Acts 10, not to all people he appeared, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And another powerful uh, example is what St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians. For I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, St. Peter, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present at the time of the writing of his epistle, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James again, and then by the apostles again, and then last of all, he was seen by me also, St. Paul, as one born out of due time. This spirit of assurance, this spirit of peace and gladness that we received is very much alive in our church. We see it in the martyrs who um, who courageously face uh, death and, and, and saying with a loud voice that nothing can separate us from the love of God, um, even death itself. And they willingly give up their life in joy and, uh, and, and contentment. And so this is a very strong testimony that that spirit of courage and assurance and of peace and of gladness is alive, um, that was alive in the apostles, uh, is still alive among all of the saints in the church, uh, among all of us. And it grows the more we personally experience Christ and the more we personally experience the power and the joy of the resurrection that Christ is indeed risen. And if he is risen, then all of the promises he made are true. And man, he has made some very powerful promises. No other promises has ever been given to humanity. And he makes these promises to us. And if he is risen from the dead, as the strong testimony that we went over today shows, then he is indeed going to fulfill every other promise that he's given to us. So may God give us that same gladness that the apostles felt during the holy 40 days, that same gladness, peace, and assurance in the power of the resurrection. May it all be with us in our homes as we eagerly await, of course, the opening of the churches so that we can uh, partake of the Eucharist and be with each other and with him in our midst, of course, to whom be glory forever. Amen. The love of God the Father, the grace of his only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, the communion and gift of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Depart in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you.